Okay, so welcome again back to everyone. Uh, <coughs> and let us uh, continue with the gradual training. Yeah. And uh, so far we have seen the kind of the arising of the Buddha in the world uh, and what the qualities of the Buddha are. Yeah. And uh, the significance of that, of course, is that uh, when the Buddha arises, what really arises is right view. Yeah, this is kind of the significance of the Buddha arising. Yeah. So when you have the Buddha, that right view comes uh, comes into existence. Prior to that, uh, that is missing. Yeah. Uh, but now you have a right view. And one of the uh, kind of the um, epithets of the names for the Buddha in the suttas uh, is he's called the Eye of the World. Yeah, the, uh, the eye, of, eye of the World is the um, Anyway, it's called the eye of the world. I can't remember the exact Pali phrase. No, that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So he's the eye of the world because he sees first. And when he has seen the reality, then of course, he has the possibility of imparting that understanding to other people. And this is why it is such a significant thing. So the Buddha comes into existence. Once the Buddha has come into existence, the next thing that arises is, of course, the Dhamma, the teachings. So after the Buddha's awakening, he'd spent some time uh, reflecting on these teachings, what it is that he has realized. Uh, and then when he's ready, he actually then uh, starts uh, giving these teachings out to uh, the world around him. And this is what happens next. So the Buddha, then we have the Dhamma coming from that. Uh, and we will see that the Sangha arises, obviously, as a consequence of that. Uh. So, uh, the next part here, then, has he declares, yeah, this is the the Dharma arising. He declares this world uh, with its gods, its maras, its brahmas, uh, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, uh, its princes, it should be its gods and its people, uh, uh, which he has realized uh, himself with direct knowledge. Uh, he teaches the Dharma good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing. Uh, and he reveals a holy life, a brahmacharya, that is utterly uh, perfect, or utterly complete, really, uh, and pure. So, uh, uh, this is the Buddha declaring uh, the world. They're yeah, starting out with uh, declaring, is interesting, with its gods, uh, yeah, Maras and Brahmas. Uh, uh, of course, these were gods that existed, again, prior to the the Buddha's arising, and Brahma and Mara were kind of words that were already used in that society. So what the Buddha is saying here is that I have understood all of this, all of these things that, uh, you know, is already part of our society, part of the uh, kind of Indian cosmology, if you like, that already existed. Uh, I've understood all the aspects of that, its limitations, etc., etc. Obviously, it sort of implies rebirth and karma as well, although it is not really stated directly here. Uh, I understand this generation with its uh, recluses and brahmins. Uh, um, that is a bit obscure, uh, what that means. Uh, well, I think this means uh, recluses and brahmins, these are the religious people of the days. Uh, the brahmins is like the uh, established religion of India, uh, with all the brahmins traveling around and uh, being like the priests of India. Uh, and then the recluses, the samanas, uh, they are then the people who go forth. Uh, yeah, and then live outside of society. And you have a large number of these kind of recluses, sometimes called ascetics, uh, large different groups, different schools, and they're kind of almost like competing with each other for uh, support and for you know, converting people and, and making them listen to their teachings, etc. So it was a very pluralistic society in those days. Uh, it's interesting, we kind of think of our modern society as being very pl pluralistic, you know, with all the different religions and you kind of go to the supermarket of religions and you choose the one that suits you best. But ancient India, in many ways, was even more pluralistic in some ways. Uh, there was all this debate going all the time. Yeah, they would sit down and debate with each other. Uh, I don't know how that would work out today. You could debate it too much. Imagine sitting around the table, one kind of one Anglican, one Muslim, one Buddhist, uh, and then kind of arguing it out, that would be very, I don't know how far we would get, but that's, that's how, what they did in those days, yeah, it's quite, it's actually quite cool, huh? and they would really hammer each other, they say, your doctrine has been refuted, yeah, overturn your, kind of, uh, <laughs> save your doctrine if you can, this is kind of out of the suit, that's how these arguments are spelled out in the suit, uh, uh, anyway, so the point here is that the Buddha 
By understanding this, what he obviously understood was the various philosophical viewpoints, yeah, including the Brahmanic population, all the other viewpoints. One of the viewpoints that he understood that was already available at that time was the materialistic viewpoint, the idea that when you die, everything comes to an end, yeah, much traditionally called materialism. Uh, uh, and that was already ex in existence at that time. Uh, so that we, uh, yeah, in other words, had a full understanding of these points of view, their limitations, uh, their relevance to what actually is true and not. Uh, and uh, uh, then, of course, uh, because of that, his own teaching in relation to all of those things. Uh, so I think that is what is meant by this. Uh, <coughs> so this generation with its recluses and, and Brahmins, its devas and its people, uh, yeah, the world with its devas and its people, uh, um, uh, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge, uh, or if you like, with insight. Uh, and that, of course, is the kind of the main point there, is that this is a direct realization, it's a direct understanding. It is not a philosophical point of view. Uh, most religious teachers, they come often from philosophical speculation, it's, so it seemed, at least in those days, uh, uh, but uh, not, not the Buddha. So he teaches the Dhamma, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. And of course the point, or the main point of that phrase, is not really explained anywhere, but you can imagine what it means. It means that the Dhamma is supposed to have good results from the start to the very end. Yeah, so from the moment you start practicing this path, it's supposed to give you good results. Yeah, and I think most people actually, if you do it right, uh, if you don't, you know, torture yourself too much when you sit down in meditation, that sort of thing, uh, and you, but you start living well, you start undertaking the five precepts, and you start trying to live a life of kindness and these things. Uh, I think most people actually recognize that that is a very, uh, is a life that supports your own well-being. Uh, you are happy, other people are happy. It's a win-win situation. Uh, yeah, we can't really do it. I think we, I think we all really can recognize that. Uh, and there are some people for whom it is difficult uh, to practice precepts, to find, find that hard. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, when you live well, uh, you find that actually it is, a, uh, it is something that is done for your own well-being. Uh, and I have I often felt that, you know, if you want to uh, define what a religious life is, or a spiritual life, not, perhaps not religious because it has certain overtones, but a spiritual life, uh, or a life well lived, yeah, whatever, how can that be defined? And I think the way to define it is a, a life that is well lived in the right way, is a life that is good both for yourself and for others. Yeah, so if what you do is good for yourself and others, then it is a spiritual action that you are performing. Yeah. So if I say something kind, yeah, if I say something kind to Hirati, it's good for you, yeah, <laughs> it's good for me as well, good for both of us. And the same thing with generosity. Generosity is good both for the giver and for the receiver. Uh, the opposite of worldly life is often one where we are more, it's more about uh, you know, looking after yourself. Greed is classically good for you, so you think at least, uh, and then, but perhaps not so good for others because you might rip them off a little bit or whatever. Uh, yeah, so this is the kind of difference between the worldly happiness and the uh, and the altruistic happiness, uh, that altruistic happiness is good for both parties uh, in that situation. Uh. And so in this way, it is good at the beginning. Of course, the beginning is often just the sila part, uh, the morality part of things. Uh, in the middle, meditation part uh, is also is good. Uh. So this is, you know, again, it's supposed to be nice. Meditation is supposed to be a positive experience. Uh, yeah, good in the middle, uh, and good in the end. In other words, uh, uh, when you get wise about these things, uh, you are happy that you achieved wisdom. Wisdom is a positive thing here. So good all the way through. In fact, saying that it is good all the way through is kind of an understatement because really what is happening here is that the goodness increases exponentially almost as you go through this. So, yeah, It gets better and better and better. In that. This is kind of the point, of course, of this. So. so I think that is the main meaning. So remember that. It's supposed to be pleasurable to live a spiritual life. Uh, uh, if you find that it becomes a burden or difficult or whatever, sometimes it's going to be a little bit of a burden. Uh, sometimes you have to, you know, to uh, just to be, uh, you know, patient and endure things a little bit. Of course, that's part of it as well. But generally speaking, it's supposed to be a positive path. But, yeah, you come back at home, you sit down and rest, and you feel good about yourself because you know that you're living your life well. Right? 
yeah, and then move it forward in this way here. So, uh, with the right meaning yeah, and right phrasing, yeah, yeah, and this is uh, just means that when the Buddha phrases the Dhamma, he does so with great care. You know, things are not random, things are not uh, haphazard, uh, things have been done with uh, a lot of forethought. Uh, yeah, sometimes you see the Buddha uh, in the suit as you see the Buddha going on retreat. Uh, and you wonder, what does the Buddha do, go on retreat for? You know, he's already kind of, you know, he's already kind of done his work, he's kind of reached the end of the path, but what's the point? And I think part of the point, well, may, maybe just to, may perhaps to relax a little bit, just enjoy the meditation perhaps, but I think also sometimes the Buddha would go on retreat to perhaps think about how, what is the best way of phrasing these teachings, you know? And, and then to experience <laughs> them, and then actually phrase them afterwards in a way that, Kind of the whole thing holds together in a very nice way. Yeah. I think that may have been part of it as well. So the phrasing is very important. Yeah. And what that means, once you get that, as I mentioned before, yeah, once you get that, uh, and you look more carefully. When you read the Sutta, uh, you look more carefully at all the little nuances, all the little points. So every little word may have a meaning here. Yeah. Yeah? And this is what kind of makes it, uh, uh, makes it special to read the Sutta. So. The right meaning, uh, sadatta. And uh, the idea here of meaning, the word meaning, atta in Pali, yeah, does not just mean meaning, it also means purpose, it means goal, it means end. In other words, the Dhamma has the right goal, yeah? It has a good goal, a true goal, something that you're moving towards. Yeah? The goal is not, a, it is not a temporary, it is not something that falls apart after a while. Yeah? It is a final and real goal that you have in Buddhism. Yeah? And it's a good one. Huh? Yeah, it brings you all the things that you ever intended, ever hoped for. Huh? So the goal, the meaning of the goal is right, the phrasing is right, and then you reveal a holy life that is utterly complete. It says perfect here. I think complete is actually a more correct translation. Perfectly or utterly complete and pure. Huh? Everything is there. You don't have to look anywhere else. Uh, all the aspects are there. Huh? Uh, you achieve complete purity if you practice these things in the right way. Yeah. So the Dhamma arises in this way. Yeah, it's a, it's a slightly un unusual phrasing of the Dhamma. It's a kind of a, it's a, obviously a summary of it. Uh, Buddha is kind of drawing out some of the main aspects of it, uh, but that is uh, the Dhamma arising in the world. And then, uh, because the Dhamma is being proclaimed, uh, the next thing is that the Sangha arises, and that is the next paragraph here. Uh, so, you have a householder, or a householder's son, or presumably also a householder's daughter, or one born in some other clan. Here is that Dhamma. <coughs> On hearing the Dhamma, they acquire faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, they consider. Hmm, consider thus. Household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life, utterly complete and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasion, abandoning a small or a large fortune, abandoning a small or a large circle of relatives, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the yellow robe and goes forth from the home life into homelessness. And that, that, of course, is the beginning of the Sangha, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Yeah, as you can see here how these things kind of evolve, gradually come into existence. So, um, uh, let us go through this in a little bit of detail, because actually it is, there are some interesting points here. Yeah. First of all, it starts off with the householder and householder's son, yeah? And then one born in some other clan, here is that Dhamma. So, what is this householder business all about? Uh, and uh, the householders in those days were, were like called the Gahapati in the Pali language. Uh, and the Gahapati means literally the lord of the house. Uh, yeah? Somebody who was the head of a household. Uh, in those days, uh, they would have always been men because that India is kind of a very patriarchal society. So you always had men on the, as the head of the household. Uh, and these would have been often large households. They would have many workers there. They would have servants, you know, many children. 
uh, 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 many kind of extended family in all kind of directions. So, so you would be almost like this would be like the pillars of society. Yeah, this would be like the establishment in ancient Indian society, the householders. So these were the people with wealth. These were the people with social position. These were the people who were respected in society, who had a degree of power and resources. Yeah, yeah, because you were in charge of like a, a household with the business and the fields perhaps and all of that uh, entailed because obviously you had to have a way of livelihood as well. Eh? So the point here is that the household goes forward. It means that even the pillars of society, eh? even the establishment, yeah, even when you have a high social position, you go forward into the monastic life. Eh? There is an interesting sutta we will have a look at later on called the Rotapala Sutta, which is a very uh, endearing little sutta, actually it's a long sutta, not little at all, a long sutta uh, about Rotapala. Rotapala became famous for the uh, disciple of the Buddha who went forth out of the most faith. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you the story perhaps later on if we have time. Uh, time is always short, there's so many stories to be told. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> we'll see how if we get there. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, in that story, uh, the king comes out and speaks to Ratapala. And he says to Ratapala, you know, yeah, you know, people, you know, when they go forward, it's because they are poor, you know, they have lost all their wealth, all their relatives have died, or they're getting old, you know. That's why people go forward. But, but you, you are young, yeah? you come from a prominent family, you're educated, you have wealth, you have everything in life, yeah? How come you went forward? And this is kind of the point of the Dharma. It is not a teaching where you wait until you're old and decrepit, yeah? You wait till your, your 90th birthday and then you go forth. Uh, it's too late when you're 90. You don't have that much energy left when you come to 90. Uh, yeah? It's, it's okay to be 90. There's nothing wrong with being 90. But it's, it's a little bit too late to go forth. Uh, the point of the Buddhist teaching is that it is precisely so important. It shows you the very, you know, as I said so many times already, the very meaning of life. So because of that, it doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or poor, whether you're high or low social status, or educated or uneducated, regardless it is right to go forth. Because regardless, human life is uh, suffering in comparison regardless of where you, what your station in life is. And this is the point here. Yeah? The point here is that even those people who are in, in a high station in, in, in life, they too go forth because they realize the profundity of the Dhamma. This is the point of saying that the householder or householder's son goes forth. Especially householder's sons, because what if you have the responsibility of a house, maybe you can't go forth, but at least your, your son or daughter can go forth at the very least. So that is the point of that. And then it says, just for you know, to make it complete, the same one born in some other clan. Yeah, this means like anyone else who is not kind of considered of the same social ranking, if you like it. So uh, it is just making the point that the Dhamma is, is profound. And then you hear that Dhamma. When you hear the Dhamma, you acquire faith in the Tathagata. Yeah, or maybe you don't. Some people don't, some people do, some people, yeah, maybe, and in between. Yeah, it depends, depends on your faculties, whether you're ready or not. So what is that? how do you acquire that faith? And uh, this is something that you find, again, in a few places in the suttas. One of the Beautiful suttas in the Pali Canon is the Vimaksaka Sutta, uh, where the Buddha specifically says to people that, you know, when you see me, when you come into my presence, you should investigate me. Yeah, the Buddha says, you should look, look for me and you should look whether there are any qualities in me of greed, hatred, and delusion. Do you see those things in me? Yeah? So he, he's inviting his disciples, he's inviting people who are new to the Buddhist teachings to investigate him. Uh, and then he says, you know, well, if you see those qualities are absent, then it is appropriate to place faith in the, in the Dhamma, in, in the Buddha, etc. He also says it in the Chakya Sutta. Chakya Sutta is Madhimadikaya, middle length segment number 95. And he says in there that the right approach when you meet a teacher for the first time yeah, is to observe that teacher. You listen to the Dhamma and you observe. And when you're, uh, what when there is a kind of a congruence between what the person teaches and the way they act, then you can have faith in that teacher. So this is what it means, you really get faith in the Dhamma, is that you know you, you don't just hear the Dhamma and you, you get faith, but you also observe the teacher to see whether they live that teaching, whether there is correspondence between 
the way they teach it and the way they act it. As you speak, so you act. This is one of the qualities of the Buddha. The way you speak is the way you act, the way you act is the way you speak. Then faith or confidence arises as a consequence. This word faith in Buddhism, sadha in, Pali, in the Pali language, it really means at least two things. There is on the one hand, there is like an intellectual acceptance of the teachings. Yeah, they make sense. Yeah, it kind of holds together. It doesn't kind of have any glaring deficiencies or anything like that. So there is kind of an intellectual kind of understanding. When you act well, you get the good results from it. You feel good about it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I can kind of relate to that. When you kind of watch your breath, you get peaceful. And when you, you know, things in the world are impermanent. So be careful with that, because otherwise you're going to, if you attach too much, you're going to hurt. Yeah, it makes sense. We're all going to die one day. That's a problem. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah, sensible teachings. So you gain an intellectual assent of those teachings, first of all. But probably just as important as the intellectual aspect of sadha is the emotional aspect of this. Because the point of the Buddhist teachings, in the end, is to make you practice. and. And intellectual knowledge often doesn't really doesn't drive us onward very much. But when you feel connected to these things, uh, and you feel that they are meaningful, uh, and when they give rise to a sense of joy that you have found something powerful, yeah, that you can practice, that you can live by, that you can make your life meaningful, uh, when that emotional side of sama arises, uh, that is when it becomes really powerful. And those two things should go together, the intellectual side and the emotional side. Uh, when they go together, that is when it becomes especially powerful. Huh? And this is why uh, the Buddha spends a lot of time in the suttas uh, talking about how to give rise to that faith, uh, how to give rise to the joy. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this whole, this whole sutta is uh, dedicated just to that topic. Yeah? How to start out your meditation in the right way so that joy arises. Uh, and it's often using the faculty of sadha, using the faculty of confidence and faith, uh, to make the joy arise. You reflect on the qualities of the Buddha. That's why I spent quite a bit of time on this this morning, because I think actually it is quite important. Yeah, if you gain a feeling like you have a relationship in a sense with the Buddha, yeah, as your spiritual teacher, then it makes the path much more powerful. You can do the same thing with the Dhamma. Yeah, reflect on the qualities of the Dhamma, a similar kind of thing. Yeah. Qualities of the Sangha, of course, same kind of thing. Uh, and uh, then, as I mentioned earlier on, you reflect on your generosity, your, your conduct, all of this. All of these things are ways of giving rise to joy on the path. And uh, so these things are, it's so important, yeah? And, and this is where sadha comes in. The more faith you have in these things, the more stronger the confidence is, uh, the more ability you will have to uh, give rise to these emotional qualities. Uh. So that is briefly uh, sadha, the meaning of uh, faith. And that's why, you know, what is a good translation for sadha? Is faith the best translation? Is confidence the best translation? It's, it's hard to say what is the best one, because uh, faith is, a, you know, it, it is a, sometimes the word faith is kind of, a, uh, has a lot of baggage to it. Yeah, it is used in Christianity, and it is used often in a sense of blind faith and all these kind of things, and it certainly doesn't mean that in Buddhism. On the other hand, confidence is a bit dry. Yeah, you're confident. Uh, it doesn't really. It lacks that kind of uh, uh, emotional aspect, perhaps. Uh, so because of that, it's sometimes it's difficult to know what the uh, best translation is. Uh, and uh, sometimes you just shrug and you kind of choose "ini mini mine mo" and you choose one of them, uh, and then you kind of uh, translate accordingly. Uh. So some people say use confidence. Some people use use faith. Uh. That's how translation happens, yeah? In, 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 okay, this word, I'll use this one. <laughs> it's almost like that, yeah? It's because sometimes you just don't know, and you kind of think, and you think you have a rational argument, and then somebody else can say, actually, there's this other side of this word, you know, you have, oh yeah, you have a point, okay, I'll change it. And the third word, actually, there's something more, you know, to this word, oh yeah, okay, change it again. And uh, hopefully, you know, eventually you end up with something decent. But actually, it is all there's always choices that you have to make, and sometimes it is very hard to find that there is no such thing as a perfect translation. Basically, there's just different translations, alternative viewpoints of what is actually being said in the Pali. <laughs> and the reason for that is because words in Pali 
don't have a perfect ma match with words in English. So it's always like that with language is yeah, yeah. This is kind of the problem here. So that's why sometimes it's nice to read different translations. One has confidence, one has faith. And you start, start to get the kind of general idea of what is going on. Yeah. Anyway, this is not the course in translating Pali, so I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> So possessing that faith, and you consider how so life is crowded and dusty here. Is that right? Yeah. I forgot what it's like. It's so long since I lived in the house of life. Crowded. I think in ancient India it was especially crowded. Isn't it? Yeah, you would live often in small houses, large families, and everyone living under one roof. Maybe you only had one or two rooms in that house. So often it was very crowded. Yeah. Uh, the Pali word, I think, here is sambada. Sambada means not just crowd, it means confined. Yeah? It means that you are kind of, you don't have that sense of openness around you. And it's kind of strange that it's one of those things that you start, I think, to realize once you become a monastic. One of the nice things about living in a monastery like Bodhinyana Monastery is that everyone has their own little kuti. Kuti is a hunt in the forest. And when you withdraw to your cute in the forest in our monastery, you don't see anyone else. It is so far apart from other cute is I, I can see some in the distance far away, like you know, you know, the other side of the valley or whatever, but nothing nearby. It feels like you're living completely by yourself. And this is one of those great things that you don't really understand what that feels like until you become a monastic or you get a chance to live like that. And it's strange, when I go back to live, you know, stay with my parents, I go back to Norway after this retreat, uh, and then I go to stay with my parents for a while, and I, you know, I'm going to live in their house, and they have a very nice house, it's not very crowded or anything like that, uh, but still, it kind of feels different when you live in the same house as somebody else. There's, a, there's almost like a psychological thing there, by living together, uh, like a kind of... Uh, uh, and that freedom, psychological freedom that arises by living away, apart from society, is actually very significant. And you see this in the suttas, the Buddha talks about two kinds of seclusion. Now he talks about the, first of all, the kaya viveka, the viveka of the body. And that means you withdraw from society, you withdraw from company around you, and you stay by yourself. And it is when you have the kaya viveka, you get the chitta viveka. Chitta viveka is is the name of one of the monasteries down in the, in the east, in Sussex, yeah, they call Chitta So when you withdraw bodily, that is when the Chitta Viveka becomes possible. Right? And you can actually feel that. It's kind of remarkable, you know. I, you, I don't mind staying with my parents for a few days, it's actually it's quite, quite nice. Yeah, it's a good thing to be able to do that. But I also feel the sense of confinement that it is to actually be so close to people. Right? Uh, compared to living in a hut by herself. Uh, on a retreat like this, it's kind of a little bit of a halfway house. Yeah, you are out of your ordinary environment, but still people are quite close by. Uh, so, but, uh, but still, it gives kind of perhaps a little bit of feeling for what it is to kind of withdraw from the household life. Uh, and uh, so this is, I think, the idea of crowded here, of sambado, you are confined. Uh, and when you are confined with people around you, what happens? Uh, you get dusty. Yeah? Is that right? You get dusty when people are around you. Yeah. It's, it's one of these expressions in the, uh, in the Pali Suttas, which dust is always a reference to defilements in the Suttas. So, yeah? so dusty means the dust of the defilements. So attachments and desires, all these kind of things. And, and you can see that happening. When you live very close to people, yeah, you rub up against each other. Uh, uh, it's very easy to kind of trigger each other, you push each other's buttons and all this kind of stuff, yeah? It's very hard to avoid when you live with people all the time, right? Uh, whereas in a monastery like ours, you know, if somebody kind of, if you feel that it's getting a bit difficult, you just withdraw to your hut, yeah, into the forest, uh, hang out with the kangaroos for a while, and you're all right again, huh? yeah? Kangaroos, they don't push your buttons quite in the same way as other human beings do, huh? <laughs> So this is kind of the beautiful thing about uh, the monastic life, and you can feel that when you try these things out. Uh, it has so many benefits in monastic life, and this is certainly one of them, very strong ones. Uh. 
So that's the here refers to the kind of the problem that arise when you live too close to people. When you have more space, it's easy to regulate your emotions. So you have more, your mind is more even throughout the day. It doesn't kind of jump up and down like a yo-yo, which it often does if you are around people all the time. If you don't want the yo-yo mind, the domestic life is the way to go. It creates that non-yo-yo non mind. And that is not a literal translation of the party, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> So, um, yeah, so because of that, uh, life gone forth is wide open. It's the idea, the opposite idea of being crowded. Yeah, you're not constrained anymore. And because you're not constrained, the defilements don't have the same ability to arise. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life, the brahmacharya, utterly complete and pure as a polished shell. Yeah, it is not easy while living in a home. And this is why the Buddha establishes the Sangha, why he establishes the idea of a monastic life uh, is to enable us to practice these teachings. They are different, difficult enough as they are to practice these teachings, uh, so we don't need to make it more difficult than is necessary then. So remember that, sometimes people think, sometimes there is a little, not so much appreciation in the West, you know, among Buddhists uh, for the importance of Sangha and going forth and these things. Uh, some people really appreciate it, but some people don't. And they say, ah, oh, yes, Sangha, that's just old fashioned, that's the cultural baggage from India. We don't really need that. Uh, yeah. Check out those monks who just practice as lay people, that's good enough. Uh, but it's not as simple as that. Uh, yeah. And this is here you find part of the reasons why it is not so simple as that, because it is far easier to practice as a monastic. Yeah. If it is far easier, it means that that is where you will find the results. So if you are likely to find an arahant in the world or someone who attains deep samadhi or becomes a stream entry, you're far more likely to find that among the monastics than among the lay people. Then. Why? But because of this. Yeah? Less crowded, less obstructed, less confined, and more ability to live the pure life in its fullness. So I, that doesn't mean, I'm not saying that you know, lay people are bad, monastics are great, or anything like that, because you find more of you here than there's me, so I'd be in big trouble if I said that. Uh, <laughs> so I'd better kind of shut up if I <laughs> don't want to offend everyone here. Yeah. I'm not really saying that. Sometimes we find lay people who are absolutely wonderful, uh, and they've gone the very, very wrong way on the path. Sometimes we find monastics who are real scallywags, uh, really dodgy characters, uh, and you wonder what they're doing in the sun <laughs> and, uh, but. Uh, what I'm saying is that if the monastic life is lived well, if it is lived to the maximum of its potential, then it also has the maximum benefit. That's what I'm saying. Here. It is easier to get those benefits when monastic life is lived well compared to when lay life is lived well. Here. That is really the only point here. here. So if you want to look for people who really have attained things, where you're most likely to find it, it is in places like the forest tradition. Yeah? People who practice according to the ancient way that it was laid down by the Buddha at that time. Right? So I think this is an important point. And it's, sometimes there isn't enough appreciation of what uh, monasticism is about. Uh, yeah, the, I, I, can, I can bring out some quotes on the suttas later on if you, if you wish. Uh, very powerful uh, testimonies to this, uh, to this idea. Uh, people, think, people say, I want to have my cake and eat it. Yeah, I want to live at home to enjoy the pleasures of the world. And I also want to meditate. Uh, right, uh, okay. Uh, Fine, you can do that, uh, but the cake is not going to be that nice. Uh, yeah? You have your cake and eat it. If you want to have a cake, you might as well have a nice cake. Yeah? Otherwise, there's no point in having it and eating it. Uh, so you, you have, to have to have a nice cake, first of all. Uh, that is kind of the point here. Uh. Okay. So, uh, you live it as pure and complete as a polished shell. So, uh, there you are. So then you think. Uh, yeah, once you have understood this, that the, uh, the limits of the home life, then you think, suppose uh, I shave off my hair and beard and put on the yellow robes. Uh, yellow is a mistranslation, should be like ochre perhaps, uh, yeah, various, various kind of colors of brown really, uh, so yellow is no good. Uh, uh, and you go forth from home life into homelessness. Uh, does that mean you go living under a bridge somewhere? Yeah. Not really. Yeah. No. It's homelessness, not, not perhaps not the best translation. Yeah. So, uh, someone suggested houselessness might be better, because otherwise it sounds like you become one of these homeless, poor homeless people, yeah, living on the street or something. Yeah. That, of course, is not really the point here. Yeah. Houselessness is quite, quite nice. Yeah. 
So you go forth, uh, yeah, and you become a monastic. Yeah. On a later occasion, abandoning a small or a large fortune. Yeah, this is one of the places, uh, it doesn't actually say in the Vinya anyway, that as a monastic uh, you're not allowed to own all kinds of things, yeah? According to the Vinya, this doesn't say very much about that. Uh, but the place where it says that you have to abandon everything is right here in the gradual training here. Yeah? So before you go forth, uh, you abandon everything pretty much. Uh, in reality, what happens is that uh, you know, you, uh, the way kind of we do things at Bodhinyana Monastery, in case some of you are interested in becoming monastics, yeah? So I don't want to kind of scare you too much. Uh, you find everything, you have nothing left straight away. It's kind of scary. So the way we tend to do things is that uh, we say to anyone who wants to ordain, we say, okay, keep your kind of some of your financial, or all of your financial names or all of your belongings or whatever for a while, maybe for five years or something. Yeah? and then you give it up after a while. Or, you give, what I did, I just gave it all to my parents, and okay, you two look after this, and yeah, it's also an easy way of doing things, and, and then they look after it. Uh, and of course, my parents, they were absolutely sure that I would only last a few years, and put all that aside in a separate bank account that would kind of be there for me whenever I kind of return to lay life again. Uh, I think now they have kind of given up on that thought, so that's, uh, that's <laughs> kind of a... <laughs> That's, that's good in a sense, yeah? so they can spend that money on something useful rather than sitting there rotting away in some bank account. Yeah? But the idea is not to make the idea of going forth too scary, because uh, sometimes when you go forth and you become a monastic, uh, you don't really know what you're doing initially. Yeah, yeah it's kind of taking a, a leap into the dark a little bit, a step into the dark, you're not sure, you're sure exactly what you're doing. So it's good to have the possibility of reversing that in case it doesn't work out for you for whatever reason. Yeah? So that's why we're trying to make the transition easy for people. We're trying to have some compassion, yeah, to make sure people are eased into the monastic life. So uh, this is not as absolute as it may sound. You abandon a small or large circle of relatives, and that too is not quite as absolute as it may sound. Yeah, you 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 don't kind of abandon your parents once and for all and never see your siblings again or ever. Uh, not in the present day, uh, not even in those days did that happen. Uh, but of course, the, you know, you try to share some of the benefits of your going forth uh, with the people who are closest to you. Uh. So, uh, then you shave off your hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and you go forth, uh, yeah, from the home life into homelessness. Uh. Uh, and uh, that is what uh, happens, and that is where the Sangha at that point has begun. Uh. And, uh, of course, that, in a sense, is the uh, arising also of, uh, you can now start to see here, how the Noble Eightfold Path unfolds. Uh, yeah, when, first of all, you listen to the Dhamma, uh, and then as you listen to the Dhamma, you gain faith in that Dhamma. Uh, what is that? That is the arising of right view uh, yeah, in the person. Uh, yeah, this, this makes sense, this is good stuff. Okay, I, I'm going to be like a Buddhist from now on. Uh, so you can say that's the arising of right view. Uh, then, uh, when you decide to become a monastic, uh, or you start, decide to start practicing the path, uh, that is the Sammatsankapa, the second factor of an overweightful path. Uh, now you start to have the right intention, yeah? the intention to ordain, the intention to renounce the worldly happinesses, uh, and to practice a life of simplicity and kindness instead. Uh, this is the Sammatsankapa, uh, yeah? the second factor of an overweightful path. Uh, uh, this factor is often translated in different ways. Uh, Ajahn Brahm translated as, as right motivation, uh, which I think is an interesting translation, but I personally prefer right uh, purpose, uh, yeah, or right aim as a translation here. Once you have right view, then the aim becomes right as a consequence. Uh, you start to aim for things that are meaningful, aim for things that actually will make you happy in a more profound sense. Uh, you get the right aim. And then when the aim is right, then you start doing the things according to that aim as a consequence of that. So right view, yeah? That changes your aim in life because you look at the world in a different way. Yeah? Your aim becomes different. When your aim is different, you start to act differently. Yeah? And that acting differently begins with the next three factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, which are all about morality, about sila, about character development in a sense. And that is what comes next here. Yeah. Okay.
So let me start with to talk about sila a little bit. It's a very interesting topic in Buddhism, the idea, idea of virtue and sila. Uh, it is uh, very interesting because uh, Buddhist ideas of morality are actually very flexible and very open and very uh, because they are so flexible and open, they are also can be used and applied to all kind of modern ethical dilemmas that we may have in the modern world. Things like, you know, euthanasia, for example, and all these kind of things. Uh, we can actually see these things through a Buddhist perspective, and all of these things are very easily incorporated by Buddhist ethics. It's one of the kind of uh, jewels of Buddhism is actually ju uh, Buddhist ethics. If you understand, co understand it correctly, uh, it actually is incredibly uh, flexible and useful. Uh. So, um, let us just start with it. So, uh, here we have, having thus gone forth uh, and possessing the bhikkhus, or the bhikkhunis, training in a way of life, uh, abandoning the killing of living beings, uh, you abstain from killing li living beings. Uh, with a rod and a weapon laid aside and conscientious, merciful, you abide compassionate to all living beings. So this is the first aspect of virtue in, in Buddhism. Uh, and on spe specifically on the Buddhist path. Uh, yeah, so you uh, possess the biggest training in the way of life. That basically just means that you uh, practice the precepts and you uh, beg for arms and this kind of thing, is it? Yeah, that's kind of the idea behind that. Uh, and then you start uh, fulfilling these uh, ideas of sila after that. Uh, and uh, this particular uh, first one here, of course, is very similar to the first precept that you have, you know, the five precepts that you people keep. Uh, so it's very similar to that, but you also notice that there is a significant difference here. Yeah, you abandon the living or killing living beings, but not just that. You, have, you lay aside rod and weapon, you are conscientious, you are merciful, and you are compassionate to all living beings. And this little extra statement there at the end, not just the abandoning of, the, of killing, which obviously is bad, that little extra thing on the end adds something to uh, Buddhist morality that is very unique to Buddhist ideas of morality. Usually when we think about the word morality in the English language or in European languages, we think about things we're supposed to abstain from. Uh, don't do bad stuff. Yeah, That's mora kind of morality. Uh, but in Buddhism, it's not just about not doing the bad stuff, it's about actually deliberately doing the good things. Uh, this is what it is saying here. You are compassionate. Uh, you are merciful. Uh, you support life, you help life if you can. You, you give people a, a, a better quality of life if you possibly can support them in one way or another. Yeah, so you are actively compassionate. And this is a, a very important distinction because very often if you do bad things, if you do things that are immoral, that come from a negative you know, mind or whatever, if you do immoral things you will feel bad about yourself. And obviously we try to avoid that. But by doing things that are deliberately good and kind, that we actually are deliberately feel good about ourselves. So in a sense, you could argue that uh, uh, avoiding feeling bad and making yourself feel good, these are the two sides of the coin uh, in Buddhist morality. Uh. So remember that all of these rules that we have in Buddhism have those two sides to them. Uh. Avoiding the bad, but at the same time also trying to do the good. And when you combine those two things, you get a very powerful code of ethics. It is much more than ordinary morality. It is an entire... That's why I say that very often to translate sila as morality is actually very deficient. Because really what we're talking about is an entire development of one's character. Yeah, The development of your yeah, habits and who you are as a person. That is really what we're talking about here. It's a much more broader development of a human being yeah, than what you normally think about. Uh. So this is the, uh, the first thing that comes out of this. Uh, the second thing that comes out of this is that uh, because the idea of compassion is put into there, yeah, what that points to is that as long as what we are acting compassionately, uh, we're not breaking any precept. Yeah, compassion is really kind of the, the significant uh, factor here that decides whether we are doing something immoral or not. Uh, this is incredibly important because uh, if you think about uh, you know, many of the kind of moral dilemmas of ethics, uh, yeah, 
take something like a voluntary euthanasia or assisted uh, suicide, yeah, which is now becoming more and more legal around the world in various places, uh, uh, is that acceptable from a Buddhist point of view or not? Uh? And if you look uh, simply at the first Buddhist precept, it says you shouldn't kill any living beings, well, that kind of blocks out the idea of youth voluntary euthanasia, because you're not supposed to help anyone to commit suicide, yeah, or to help them to die, even if they are suffering terribly, even if they're begging you to please turn off that life support, still you can't do it according to that idea of the first precept. But if you take into account that compassion is one of the main ingredients in what actually makes something moral or immoral, then suddenly the idea of assisted suicide or voluntary euthanasia suddenly becomes possibly acceptable. Yeah? If you have put in a lot of safeguards, you're absolutely sure that the person actually wants to die. Yeah? You had a couple of doctors maybe checking them out or whatever, and you have done all your homework properly, and you're sure that you are coming from compassion, yeah? You don't secretly want them to die because you don't like them or whatever, but you're actually coming from real compassion, yeah? Then uh, there is, from a Buddhist point of view, if it really is real compassion and wisdom, there is nothing immoral in that act. It's fascinating, right? Of course, I, you have to be careful. You really have to look into your own heart. Only you can make this decision whether it's right or not in any particular circumstance. As a monk, I could never guide you on that because I can't tell where you're coming from. I, don't, I can't tell your motivations, you know, apart from maybe some very superficial observations. But generally speaking, I can't say anything about your motivation. Everyone has to make that decision for themselves. But if the more you are leaning towards compassion, understanding, wisdom in these decisions, uh, the less likely you are to make any bad karma at all in that kind of situation. Uh, yeah, that's really all I can say. Bad karma depends on your motivation. Uh, and uh, if you read the suttas again very broadly, you, there is a nice sutta in the Agutranika that talks about the roots of actions. Uh, yeah, the roots, and these roots are essentially the motivations that lie behind actions. Uh, and these roots are uh, usually, loba dosa moha, uh, yeah, loba means like desire, really. It's often translated as greed, but it's, greed is kind of too narrow. It's called a desire. Uh, dosa, often called hatred, which is way too narrow, yeah. It should be something like ill will is much better. Uh, if you say hatred, hatred is a very, very too, way too powerful emotion. Uh, and then you have moha, and moha is like often translated as delusion. Uh, but it means something like confused mindset, yeah? Something where you have lacking in clarity about what is going on there. Uh, so these are the three roots of unwholesome actions. If you are motivated by any of these things, uh, it is going to be a bad act. It's as simple as that. If you are motivated by that and you act based on those things, uh, that is when you actually are making bad karma. That is the definition of bad karma in the suttas. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't have any loba, a loba, a dosa, a moha, yeah, so you don't come from desire, you don't come from ill will, you don't come from delusion. And the opposites of these are basically, uh, so if you are not coming from desire, it means you're coming from, perhaps from generosity, or at least giving up the desire, not coming from ill will, you're coming perhaps from compassion and, and um, uh, metta even, towards the person. Uh, and the opposite of delusion or confusion is clarity of mind. You know what you're doing here. So if you, if you act based on these three wholesome roots, uh, called the kusala mula, or the kusala hetu, uh, yeah, in part, if you're acting from those, uh, then it is not bad karma, by definition. Uh. So all you have to do in Buddhism, instead of following you know, the five precepts absolutely rig rigorously, uh, we, there is a lot of flexibility built into the Buddhist idea of ethics. Uh. So and this is ultimately, at the end of the day, this is actually what decides whether an act is moral, whether it's good or bad karma from a Buddhist point of view. Now. And it opens up the field yeah, of uh, Buddhist ethics and magnificently. It makes it possible for us to make ethical decisions that are very, uh, you know, very flexible compared to the vast majority of other belief systems around it because of this incredible flexibility in Buddhist ethics. So it's actually a very, very, it's a very uh, wonderful thing. We can make 
you know, ethical questions about uh, ethical decisions of that, even lying, for example, yeah, outside the scope of what people normally think, yeah, or about all kinds of uh, modern ethical dilemmas that we might have. Uh, Buddhism, as a, from a Buddhist point of view, it is not that hard to know what is uh, uh, right and wrong, and uh, you have a scope, a lot of scope for uh, navigating this uh, modern ethical dilemma. So, so this is uh, one aspect of ethics in Buddhism. The other aspect, and this is something that uh, people are also often not really aware of in Buddhism, is this uh, uh, idea, people tend to think that karma is either good or bad. Yeah, it's either black or white, good or bad karma. And very often if you are a monk, yeah, this is what happens when you're a monk, people come to you and they say, oh, I did this, is it good or bad karma? And I say, don't know, yeah, I have a clue what's good or bad, you know, only you can know that. Look into your heart, well, where, where are you coming from, what did you do it? Yeah, oh, well, I don't know, I was confused, perhaps not sure, I did this and that. And the point is that karma is not as simple as that. It's not either good or bad. Because if, if karma really is absolutely good, coming from an absolutely pure mind, then that kind of karma is the karma you do after you come out of samadhi, when the mind is purified of all the hindrances. It's very rare that we do karma that is absolutely pure. On the other hand, to do karma that is absolutely dark takes very powerful defilements. Yeah, if you kind of kill somebody out of hatred, well, that's kind of really bad karma. So, in between that, there's a vast range of karma which comes in all shades of grey. Yeah? So, and, uh, and, and for most of us, when we do ac actions of karma, it, our intention is neither very bad nor very good. It may be a little bit good or a little bit bad. Yeah? So, we kind of are in various shades of grey. And this is called in the sutra as the karma that is a, a both dark and bright, giving both dark and bright results. Uh, and that result, among other things, is to be reborn in the human realm. Uh. So remember that. Our, our job, in a sense, is not to make only good karma. You can't just make completely bright karma, completely white karma. It's almost impossible, unless you've already attained a deep state of samadhi. Only then can you make karma which is absolutely bright. Uh. So our job, in a sense, is to move up the spectrum of greatness. Yeah? Make come out with a little bit less grey. Yeah, avoid the dark grey comma and make kind of bright, brighter, lighter grey comma. Yes, makes sense. Yeah, so you kind of think, okay, how can I make this com make comma with a slightly less a, sh a lighter shade of grey? Yeah, how can I have a bit more compassion? How can I imbue my actions with a bit more understanding? How can I have uh, when I am generous? How can I make the, the generosity a little bit more pure? Yeah. This is what it is about. Uh, there are shades of grey. So we, you try to stretch yourself a little bit uh, towards the right shade of grey and away from the darker shades of grey. Uh, and as you do that, you are kind of moving gradually in the right direction. Uh, remember the training of the mind, the overcoming of the defilements of the mind. is a gradual process. Uh, yeah, it happens gradually. You have to start off with the course of defilements. Uh, then when the course of defilements are kind of out of the way, then you move on to more the middling defilements. Uh, and then you go on to the refined defilements. Then you go on to the super refined defilements. Uh, and eventually you kind of get rid of the defilements altogether. It's a gradual process. Uh, you have to start with a course of things. Uh, otherwise it's not going to work out. Uh, and this is what I mean by moving to brighter, lighter shades of grey in a gradual, gradual way. Uh, so um, uh, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and that is how then you can decide about this idea of killing. Yeah? When is it bad to kill? When is it? Uh, uh, and usually, of course, killing is to be avoided. Uh, usually, it comes from an unwholesome state of mind. Uh, but sometimes it is, uh, uh, it is uh, not bad. In, and in extreme circumstances, it may, may even be good karma if you do it in the right way, with compassion, with the right understanding. Yeah? So the Buddhist moral code is, is not very fixed, it's very flexible, uh, and there's a lot of leeway in there. Uh, and this is one of the beautiful things about this moral code, uh, and it's something you don't get to hear very much when you listen to a traditional kind of Buddhist uh, uh, understanding of these things. Uh, probably, you know, more, many Buddhist monastics will consider me utterly <coughs> heretical even for saying these things. Uh, so uh, I hope you don't consider me too heretical. Uh, because otherwise it gets kind of difficult. But uh, you know, but to me, these are actually one of the things that makes 
the Buddhist teaching so beautiful that they have an inbuilt flexibility, that there's so much common sense to them. Uh, because to me, this is just common sense, that this is how morality works. Uh, and actually, it is reflected in the suttas. And it gives me more, if anything, gives me much more confidence in these teachings uh, that the Buddha really, uh, really had seen deeply into these things, understood the human mind in a very profound way. Yeah. So that, that is um, morality anyway, that, that is the killing. Another thing, of course, that often comes up is things like abortion. Yeah, you, as a monk, you're very often asked you know, about abortion and, uh, and uh, whether that is good or bad, or whether, you, whether it is acceptable or, or what. And again, it is one of those very complicated things uh, because it is not black and white in Buddhism. Yeah, it is not, neither, neither is it uh, absolutely good nor absolutely bad. It depends on so many factors. Uh, why are you going to have an abortion? Yeah, this is kind of so fundamental. If you have thought about all the alternatives and you know that there is a serious problem here and that you know that it's a bad idea to have this uh, being you know, come to, into the world in the current circumstances or whatever, and you have thought about it carefully, you consider the overall picture and you think it is a bad idea, then it is not such a bad thing yet. But if you do it rationally without any care or considerations for, you know, for what might be a, a, a being which already is, has, has a sense of feelings to it, then of course it can be much worse karma. Yeah, so it depends. It also depends on whether there is consciousness in that being, in that fetus already. If consciousness has already arisen, then that fetus is likely to be able to feel. Yeah? And a being that can feel, obviously, if you uh, heard a being that can feel, then uh, there is a, uh, the potential, you know, again, you are likely to make bad karma. But if consciousness has not arisen, of course, there is no issue. There's no problem at all. So what that means is the earlier on you do it, the, the less of a problem it is. Uh, it also has to do with the development of that fetus, how developed it is. Uh, the less developed it is, in the very early days, it is no more than a few cells. Yeah, it's like a, uh, you know, it's like an insect, even or even less in the very early early days, uh, it is not such a big deal. Uh, the later it is, the worse it is. Uh, but it is never equivalent to killing a fully grown human being, of course. Uh, of course not. Uh, it's a very different situation from that. Uh, but the more care you take in the decision, the more you ensure that you come from a sense of compassion and understanding, take all the right considerations into account, uh, and the less likely you are to make uh, much bad karma in that situation. Uh, yeah, so it's complex, it's complicated, it's not ideally we should avoid it, uh, but sometimes it is very hard to avoid these kind of things. Uh. So that is, uh, uh, and you can expand this to all kinds of ideas, you know, these days they talk about kind of, uh, they talk about uh, how to clone people, is cloning good or bad from a Buddhist point of view? Uh, you know, is it good to have like, you know, who should we clone? Who would be a good person to clone? Like maybe Ajahn Brahm, so doesn't have to travel so much. Yeah, so get a thousand Ajahn Brahms, you can do a thousand retreats simultaneously. Is that a good idea? <laughs> maybe it is a good idea, yeah? So you can go can kind of be in a thousand places one go and give a retreat. I think Ajahn Brahm probably very happy. And then a real Ajahn Brahm, make can just chill in his cave, yeah, just meditate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the real one, that's all the clones of the work. Yeah. And you kind of have a tape recorder, just kind of blah, 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 kind of go on about that. Uh, we have a rock, there's kind of a few stories and a couple of jokes, and then you can load them up, and then bang, they go in, and they kind of uh, pretend to be as a brown. Uh, that is kind of the end. So cloning can be good, yeah? If you use it for that purpose, for compassion for Adam Brown, cloning is good. Uh, so if, again, it depends on your motivation. If your motivation for cloning is good, then cloning surely itself must be good as well. Uh, that's kind of my rationale anyway. So again, cloning from Buddhist point of view, is it a big problem or not? Probably not, yeah. It's just okay. So maybe this person looks like you, yeah, you get the kind of another Ashram Brahmana sitting next to me. That would be really scary. That would be really scary. And now please don't uh, uh, perish the thought. <laughs> that is not a, but uh, uh, there's nothing really because it would be a different person. Yeah, the mind wouldn't be the same because the mind comes from its own stream of consciousness from the past. Uh, might look like me, uh, yeah, but actually would be a very different person. Maybe it would have the personality of Venerable Chanda or something, uh, yeah, sitting there. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, personality of Venerable Chanda looking like me, yeah. And then you reverse, that would be very interesting, yeah. But uh, so you have, so, so it doesn't really matter, it's just a different being. 
But somehow, of course, from our kind of modern perspective, what we think that we will create a person that is exactly the same. Yeah. So kind of we will be, you know, the personality will be the same. But of course, that isn't the case at all. Personality will often be completely different. So cloning, yeah, okay. You know, I don't have, want to have kind of clone too many Hitlers and that sort of stuff. But uh, you know, but otherwise, uh, sure. You know, worst point of view, not, not, not a big, big, big deal, I think. Uh, unless you have some good arguments, and I'll be happy to listen to those arguments. Uh, anyway, uh, that is enough uh, for now. And uh, so let's have another uh, pray to continue meditating, meditating, whatever you would like to do. Uh, and we'll see you back again at 7 p.m. this evening. Okay.